Hi guys, welcome to another chemical engineering tutorial brought to you by the ChemEng student. In this lesson, we're going to take a look at the Cox chart for vapour pressure systems. Now, before we start, I would just like to congratulate our last month's winner of the £500 a month for a full year, that's Alex Denny, for answering the correct question to the previous uh, video. So, very well done um, to Alex for uh, giving us the correct answer. Um, and for your next chance uh, to enter for this month, um, we will have one of the questions featuring at the end of this video. So be sure to watch all the way through to the end so you can be in with a chance of winning £500 every month for an entire year. But anyway, let's get started. So, the question here is, what is a Cox chart? Well, in essence, a Cox chart is a graphical means of estimating the vapour pressure of a pure substance at a fixed given temperature. Now, it's very, very important that we ensure that we highlight the key words within this sentence because the first key word here is an estimate. So, the, any chart or any figure will not give you a precise you know, determination of that value because there will be an element of human error and there will also be an element of error within the graph itself. So when we use graphs uh, and indeed, you know, the, the Cox chart, it's a, a means of estimating. So you get a good, you know, estimation, but just make sure that when you're quoting these values that you remember that it's an estimate, not a fixed um, guaranteed 100% value. Now, the next keyword would be pure. So what I mean by that is in order for these systems to work, we use a reference um, compound. So a lot of the time we'll use like water as a reference compound and we'll see one of the examples of the Cox chart where we use water as a reference compound. But essentially what we're trying to do here is say that for these systems, we are assuming that they are pure uh, substances. Now, We'll look at how it actually works um, in just a second. But essentially, the Cox chart came about when it built on the work of the Clapeyron equation. Now, for those that are familiar with the Clapeyron equation, um, we talk a lot about that um, in a few of our different chemical engineering courses. I'll put a link in the description to that, and you can check that one out. But the Clapeyron equation, or the, the classiest Clapeyron equation, um, is very, very useful in for us to determine vapour pressures. And we can do that at different points within the system. So the Clapeyron equation allows us to determine either the, the inlet or the outlet vapour pressures or indeed temperatures for a given system because all we need is the vapour pressures and temperatures at the inlet and the outlet. We need the universal gas constant and the enthalpy of vaporization. So the Clapeyron equation looks something like this. So it's plotted on a logarithmic scale. And that's what we'll see with the Cox chart is that is also on a logarithmic scale. So it's a logarithmic plot of ln of the ratio between the pressure at the inlet and the pressure at the outlet is equal to the multiplication of the enthalpy of vaporization divided by the universal gas constant multiplied by the difference in the reciprocal of 1 over the temperatures. So T1 being the temperature at the inlet and T2 being the temperature at the outlet. Now the Cox chart is the logarithmic plot of the vapour pressure against an arbitrary temperature scale. So what we mean by that is it's only the y-axis, because the vapour pressure is on the y-axis, that is the one that is the logarithm. The x-axis, which is the temperature scale, is just a standard Cartesian coordinate. So we don't have um, like logarithmic scales, we just have standard Cartesian coordinate systems. Now, in essence, the, the vapour pressure uh, temperature plot, it forms a straight line. And this is at least for the reference compounds. 
And normally, most of the materials are related to the reference compound. So there is a plethora of different Cox charts for different types of systems. So you might have different reference compounds. You might have ones for organic compounds. You might have ones for inorganic compounds. You might have one for gases, uh, for ideal gases, for liquids. It just depends on your system and your reference material. Now, in addition to forming these nearly straight lines, the, the compounds of the same family tend to appear to converge on a single point. So therefore, it is necessary to know only the vapour pressure at one temperature in order to estimate the position of the vapour pressure line. So it becomes very, very convenient when we try and determine, especially when we have like compounds within the same family, we create this kind of arrangement here. So this is actually using water as a reference. So this is the vapor pressure against temperature. So what we can see here is this is the classification of different hydrocarbons. So we have from C2 all the way to C35. And what we can see here is this dashed line indicates that this is the reference compound. So it's H2O, this is the water reference compound. And because these are all of the same family, all these hydrocarbons, you can see they tend to converge at this kind of point. But if we wanted to take a more general overview, you could say, you know, they converge at that kind of point. But you get the general idea that they are converging to a similar area. It's not, you know, one graph is, you know, away up here, the other graph, you know, is away down here. So you can kind of see that relationship. Now this approach is very useful and can sometimes be better than the Clapeyron method. So rather than using the Clapeyron class S equation, what we can do is we can use a Cox chart in order to determine the vapour pressure of a pure substance at a fixed given temperature. So before we actually look at a full example, this is the process that we you would use for... Um, determining the vapour pressure using a Cox chart. Now, there is only a couple of steps and it is very, very straightforward. So step number one would be to locate your desired compound from the appropriate Cox chart. And I mentioned that before, that there is different Cox charts for different compounds. And they might use different reference compounds, but generally you'll find that the reference will be a stable uh, compound that's you know very readily available because these are done through experimental analysis so you know they use things like water. Now we then need to determine the operating pressure and ensure that the units are the same so sometimes you know the question might give you in degrees celsius but the the chart might be working in degrees fahrenheit so you would need to do some form of convergence. Now you then draw a straight vertical line from your operating temperature. So remember, the temperature is on the x-axis. So what you'll do is you will locate your uh, temperature and you will just draw a straight line all the way up. And at the point of intersection with your desired compound, because as we've seen in the previous chart, different compounds have different uh, characteristic straight lines. So at the point of intersection between the temperature line, when we intersect here, we just draw a horizontal line towards the y-axis and we simply read off the pressure. And that would be your vapour pressure at your given te fixed temperature. So let's have a look at how this will work. So here we have a series of different compounds with their respective vapour pressures on the y-axis on logarithmic plot and we have temperature in Fahrenheit on a standard plot. So we're just going to do a couple of examples here. Now, what's important to note is the dots indicate the critical points. So we go deep into what critical points are in our uh, thermodynamics or heat transfer or fluid mechanics uh, courses. So again, I'll put a link in the description to them and you can check them out. Uh, but the critical points are... Um, quite interesting if you want to know more about how these compounds actually behave and what is actually taking place after and just before we reach the critical point. But anyway, so I'm going to use 
propane as an example. So what I've done here is I've located the compound that I'm working with. So I've highlighted this here in green. Now what I'm then going to do is I'm going to say that my temperature is going to be at 0 degrees Fahrenheit. So now I've located my temperature, all I have to do is draw a vertical straight line until I reach my reference compound. Now this point of intersection, once we have it, we just draw a line straight across and that will tell us that at 0 degrees Fahrenheit for propane, the vapour pressure, now remember this is pure propane, the vapour pressure would be 40 pounds per inches squared. Now say for example we wanted to do the nitrobenzene. The nitrobenzene we can see here doesn't actually even reach 0 degrees on at 0 degrees Fahrenheit on the temperature scale. So what that means is there would be no vapour at that point within the system. So at that temperature, we would have completely saturated liquid nitrobenzene. We wouldn't have any uh, possible vapour within our system. It would be 100% liquid. So that's just a, a key point to note within given systems is you might ask, well, why you know, do these feature down at these temperatures, whereas these ones will only feature at the higher temperatures? And that's where um, the idea of saturation between saturated liquid, saturated vapour, etc. That's what's happening here. But we'll do exactly the same thing. We have nitrobenzene. We have located our compound. We'll take a reference um, temperature here of 400 and uh, I think that's 10 um, degrees Fahrenheit. The point of intersection we will draw across and you can see we are just under um, 20 pounds um, per inch squared of vapour pressure. So we could maybe say 18 um, pounds per inch squared of vapour pressure. So you can see how easy it is to use a Cox chart. It's very, very straightforward and it's much more convenient than having to you know, perform numerical calculations such as the Clapeyron equation. So you, again, you are sacrificing a bit of accuracy here, but for convenience and getting a rough estimate, then the Cox chart is definitely the most convenient way. Now, on to our uh, competition. As I said before, uh, congratulations to Alex Denny, who won um, our August competition. So, very well done. Um, she answered the correct um, question on the previous video. Um, so, this is the first video for our September uh, competition. There will be a couple um, of videos for September, so be sure to check them out when they get uploaded um, and just answer and comment your answer um, to each of the questions to be in with a chance of winning £500 every month for an entire year. So the question is very, very straightforward. It's whose law is often used in vapour pressure problems? So there's no trick questions. It's very, very simple. Simply type in the person's name of, of the law that you tend to find and use within vapour pressure problems. So that is all you have to do, is comment the correct answer to this question in this video. Like and subscribe to the channel because only valid subscribers with the correct answer will be entered into the draw. And be sure to subscribe to our uh, Facebook page because that's where the winner will be announced um, every month. So we'll keep you updated, um, but good luck um, and just comment your answer to this and we look forward to seeing all your different answers. So that's the end of this lesson. Thanks for watching. Hopefully this was helpful in understanding how to use the Cox uh, chart. If you like this video, please like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us reach as many chemical engineering students as possible. Thank you for your time and good luck with the competition and we hope to see you in another video.